welcome um, to one of many Arts and Letters events. When you walked in, you received two items. You received a program for today, this morning's event, and then you also received Arts and Letters, um, I want to call it a program as well, which is full of events. It already started on Friday. We had an art gallery opening. And then we have events today, tomorrow, all day. Thursday, I believe, we have events as well. So feel free to, you know, uh, peruse through the program and attend, you know, all or some, whatever you're um, able to do. All right, so let's begin. I can't see. Okay, all right, so Professor Sandra Castillo has been at Miami-Dade College for 26 years and teaches in the Social Sciences Department. She was born in Havana, Cuba, but left the island of her birth with her family in the summer of 1970 on one of the last of President Johnson's freedom flights and grew up in South Florida. For 25 years, she has been writing about the exile experience. Her work explores um, issues of memory history, gender, and language, but it reflects a personal vision tied primarily by history, personal and otherwise. She depicts contradictory worlds, the memory of a homeland and memory of politics while examining the ordinary reality of exile, as well as the duality of existence. This morning, Professor Castillo will be reading from her new book, Eating Moors and Christians which will be published at the end of April. It is a startling collection of poems of her life in post-revolutionary Cuba, of exile in Miami, and her journey back, each time unearthing powerful new memories and voices that become part of this great ajiaco, which means a stew, a hearty stew, right? Of magic, glorious food, and unforgettable people as well as the haunted spaces between history and sorrow. Here's a description of the book by a fellow author, Chantal Acevedo, which I had the privilege of uh, meeting last year. Um, Sandra Castillo's verses navigate the turbulent waters of Cuban history and its realities. Exile, revolution, and homecoming are revealed in imaginary that evokes the mysteries of the Cuban heart and soul. The poems are a lyrical excursion through a place that feels at once forbidden and familiar, reflecting the torn feelings of many Cubans, both los de aquí y los de allá, which means both from here and those from over there. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Sandra Castillo. One of my students was nice enough to tell me because she kind of went to Amazon to see if my book was available. And it turns out that my book, which will be uh, out at the end of the month, uh, is entitled Eating Moors and Christians. And um, it is available for pre-order on Amazon. Yay! I did not know that. Thank you for sharing. Very cool. Okay. Um, so I was going to read some um, poems from the new collection, Eating Moors and Christians, and maybe I'll read one that you picked out from uh, an older collection entitled My Father Sings to My Embarrassment. He did, actually. Okay. Um, okay, so um, as Professor uh, Fernandez Sterling uh, stated, uh, I was, in fact, born in Cuba. I lived there till um, I was about eight. So we came to the United States when I was a kid. Um, I grew up in the United States, have spent <laughs> all my life, except for those few years in Cuba. So I consider myself an American. Um, but I think that who I am as a person, the things that I value and consider important were forged on an island a long time ago. So. Um, I'm going to kind of start with a kind of a lighthearted poem. It's pretty self-explanatory. There is some Spanish, but usually when I use it, the what comes before it or after kind of clues you in to what I'm actually saying. And when I don't, 
I'll tell you what it means, okay? So this is called, this is what happens when I fall asleep. Though I cannot see myself, I know that I am there. Standing on the gray, grease-stained driveway at the Alinas in Marianao, La Lisa, in Havana, Cuba. I am the adult, I never was there. Sunlight outlines my hair, a halo, and the wind, the perfect partner, swirls my flower print dress, touches my knees, spins me into a waltz of tropical colors, and I tilt into the distance that echoes like the skin of summer. So when I dream, I'm often there, which is kind of a strange thing. Um, you know, and sometimes the dreams are things that I remember from when I was a child, and sometimes things are a little darker. So that's the sort of lighthearted version. This one is um, the one I'm about to read. Actually, appears in the new collection, and it's called the Dream, and it has um, an epigraph um, by Theodore Refke, um, who some of you might know. Anyway, it says, "Dark, dark, my light and my darker desire, my soul like some." Heat maddened summer fly keeps buzzing at my sill, which I is I, the dream one, mother's version. We walk past certain darkness to look into the lighted windows of closed shops until a ghost of a stranger, a shadow she cannot quite make out in the outline of night, pulls me to him, hands me a small silver knife. I turn to her, cut into my chest, bleed red into the black night. Two, mine. I dream my own darkness. Water is black, it connects us to land. I can swim through the oil black thickness and come up for air in Cuba, the country of memory, but only if I can hold my breath longer than two minutes, the breath of night. So when I was a kid, I think I was about seven. My family first started talking about we're leaving. Um, and you know, when you're a kid, you know, the information is sort of filtered through what your parents want to tell you, what they think they can tell you, and they mostly don't tell you the whole story. Uh, but I was uh, a peculiar child, a nosy child, um, and I think I knew what was coming. And um, even within the concept of the limitations of childhood and memory and such, um, I had this idea that, do I really want to go? And is that a choice that I have to make? And so um, this particular poem, which again appears in the new collection, sort of explores that, that conflict, you know, conflicted feelings about how do you leave your homeland, right? And I, and I know that as a kid, while it seems really difficult for me, I, I can only imagine what it was, must have been like for my, my parents, so leavings. They sleep in one large room. Sonia, Ting, Saida, Edico, and Roli. And I cut through Peralta's backyard to their tiny apartment, where at night, Edico and I find our way to the roof to count the stars. Saida is almost 15, and Sonia and I take the bus downtown every Sunday to collect discarded ice cream cups to hold the pasta salad Sonia will make for her birthday party. Mother doesn't think we'll be able to go, to see her dance in her long pink dress as she smiles her way into womanhood. The Abelia, my mother says, has called us to America. Mother says that means I will never again sit on Sonia's tar paper roof, that the Armando will move into our house and we'll be able to send gum in our letters the way the Abelia does now, that the twins will learn English before they remember these first few years. In dreams, the Abelia waves, signaling for us to come, her tall body wrapped in a blue and red airmail envelope like a cloak. Mother waves back, clutching the twins in her arms, begs me to hurry, but I hesitate, knowing Sonia has had a slow day. A couple years um, ago, can't remember how many exactly, but um, I had a student in my ENC 1101 class. Anybody in ENC 1101? Anyone? Yeah? OK. So um, their first uh, essay for that particular class was uh, to write a, a personal narrative. And she ended up writing this amazing paper. And 
in part I was interested in the subject matter, but it was the way she told her story about coming to the US. I'm always interested in immigrant stories. And she just did such a great job at telling hers. And um, I gave her an A on the paper because she deserved it, it was fabulous. Uh, but I wrote her a poem in response to the essay as well. So this is for her. So to Jenny on peering into her life. I see you, not as you stand before me, so full of language threatening to spill from you, a silver blue luminous substance the page of cups might carry in love in a gold chalice, but as a child I might have held on that island where we might have become anyone other than ourselves. You are a sound you say your father carries, a beat in the heart of an African drum that seduced him with the thunder of Chango, the red of blood and earth, a flesh pink guava growing inside you, the seeds on the tips of your fingers, like islands, like memories, becoming leaves, their vein undersides becoming maps, palm lines, bridges, where the sound of water collects the past in a blue bucket of memory, where my tío Machuco stands, with childhood sandwiches I ate, sitting on the cold terrazzo, leaning against the southwest red of that couch, the Ailda discarded like a useless memory, when we were no longer voicing Voices in open rooms with connecting doors, when we were words on onion skin paper, a tra as transparent as rewritten history or exile. So there's um, this Chilean poet uh, named Omar Lara, and I was reading. I'm kind of fascinated by Chile and the history of Chile and how many things about that country and. Um, are similar to Cuba. Anybody from Chile? Chileans? Cool. And so uh, I've read a lot about the history of Chile and um, some Chilean poets in particular. And um, Lara wrote a poem based on a photograph of himself as a child. And I thought, oh, that is such a great idea. OK, I'm going to steal the concept, borrow the concept. And so, so I did. So I, I took um, a photo from my own childhood, and I wrote about my picture. But um, I, I dedicated the poem to him because the idea is sort of born from what he did. So it's called Photograph with Respect for Omar Lara. Photograph. One. I am the six-year-old in the center, the timekeeper in the Havana blue dress, waving as if to say, adios, Havana. The birthday girl sitting on the lacquer black coffee table, mother dragged out to the portal for the afternoon, two years before we lose everything. But there's no way of knowing any of this. Estio Alberto measures the existing light, the distance between me and the inevitable, mapping our lives with photographs. Two. The red and green croto plants framing the shot. The heroina's house behind me, its wooden green Caribbean windows shut tight, a skeleton inside. Diango singing between our lives about geography or distance, about what you cannot forget. The color of grief, language pressed between flesh and nostalgia as she wastes away from love or cancer, the past lost or unreachable. Three. Here, at the edge of the afternoon, I cast my own shadow, myself as other, the dark dergotypes, the mis antepasados, cafeteleros, españoles, isleños, generaciones perdidas, not yet lost, destroyed, cut into fragments, the mosaic pieces of the past, our ancestry, along with the passport pictures, the mi abuela Isabel, mi abuelo Leopoldo, that might expose those who will choose to stay behind, imagining that they will always be themselves here, where everything is familiar and that we will never return to this life. This long summer house so haunted with whispers, so filled with the scent of olive oil and garlic to find how little survives. So in 1994, my mother and I visited, I know, it, I think I can say it now because, you know, Obama has changed the landscape of U.S.-Cuba relations. Yay, okay. Um, so in 1994, my mother and I went to Cuba for the first time. Um, and it was a kind of pilgrimage. Um, I would never have gone without my mother. Uh, my mother was kind of like my passport into the past. I would be completely mortified to go to Cuba without my mom. Um, she's sort of like the vehicle that enables me to go um, gives me permission in some philosophical, psychological way. Uh, it's 
my relatives in Cuba, it's my mother they know, not me. You know, I left when I was a kid. So you know, my mother's sort of the entryway into the past. So um, I wrote this poem um, about that first time. So La Lisa is where I used to live <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, and the address in the poem is actually the physical address of where I used to live. So the poem is entitled La Lisa, Marianao 15, La Habana, Cuba. And that's like saying, you know, Miami, Florida, 33155. Okay. We sit on the front porch of my childhood, my old home, number 15812. Avenida 89, entre la 158 y la 160. For those of you who don't speak English, that's the rest of the address. In the house my grandparents bought when the world was so much smaller. On the same wrought iron chairs my mother sat in 1961, her hands on her stomach as if embracing Jorge, her first child, whose death would come in the midst of history, la crisis de octubre. Peralta still stands next door, and from his rocking chair, he waves to me, sends regards to my father like we were still neighbors, like we still lived here. My cousin Alina, who last stood before me when she was six years old, wears the same look she did in those black and white photographs of those years. And Panchito, one of our old neighbors, is retelling the story of how my sister crawled out onto the back porch patio and fell into the well, like nothing has happened here since 1966. I photograph it all with Catholic grief, a mosaic of sin and guilt, this slow blur into the past, mourn the loss, todo lo perdido, in this, the city of my dreams, where everything and nothing has changed. So I teach history, and I'm always sort of interested in not just history that is personal, uh, but also you know how we sort of fit into the larger landscape, Cuban history, U.S. American history, U.S. Cuba relations, that kind of thing, sort of Cuba and the larger world. Um, and this poem sort of addresses that, particularly uh, with regards to the Cold War, because in, uh, how many of you know what that is, the Cold War, right? Okay, so um, I was a Cold War baby, so. That's what the poem is entitled, and it sort of deals with that, the, the larger scope of uh, Cold War, but also how it affects people on the ground, so to speak, right? I was a Cold War baby, caught between the fallacy of an innocent past and the shadow of La Cuba de Mi Infancia, a blood-red guidebook, a twisted map of desire, Roombas and sambas and mambos and sorrow dances, gangsters and tricksters and shapeshifters, corruption under a Cuban flag, an empire of conflicting signs, gusanos y traidores, fidelistas, batistianos, bearded revolutionaries, counter-revolutionaries, espias y chivatos, sabotage, exile raids, the bombing of Cuban airfields, curfews and explosions and conspiracies, the dualities of this life sandwiched between La Invasión de Playa Girón, the Bay of Pigs, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, in this Caribbean witch hunt where los sospechosos, the politically suspicious, are rounded up. The Estela, the nanny of Cucusa, Lima's daughter, the Oberto, the photographer, accused of being a member of the CIA because he photographed, because his photographs exposed him, made him a target. And he was taken to El Morro by El Hedo, who confiscate the details of our lives after dragging him from his bed in our home, numero 15812, avenida 89, entre la 158 y la 160. Tio Casimiro for being a member of La Rosa Blanca, because here everyone is a suspect, here everyone is a spy, and living is a game of point the finger and save yourself. I really did feel like that. How many people were born in Cuba? Okay, and my students? Yeah, okay. I knew about you. That was a game. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I was born after the revolution, right? So I, I didn't have like the pre-whatever that everybody talks about in Miami that sort of comes with a whole lot of nostalgia, right? So I, by the time that I was born, Fidel Castro was already in power. Um, and so the Cuba that everybody talks about, you know, I, I didn't know that Cuba, right? Because 
And so, um, so the world had sort of largely changed, right, from my parents. Um, and so, uh, so I only sort of knew the aftermath. And I say that uh, because that's sort of the context in which I grew up, right? Um, and so, um, so this poem sort of uh, addresses uh, that. But one of the things that ended up happening that I, I do make mention of is, um, so after everybody started leaving Cuba, you know, the earlier you came, the more you had to lose. I'm sure you guys know that, right? Patterns of immigration. Um, and so, you know, we came rather late to, into exile, right? So we're looking at, you know, uh, 1972. Um, and so, so what ends up happening is that um, people who were loyal to the revolution uh, in Cuba were given, and I mean given, the homes of everybody who left. Does that make sense? Right, as a kind of, um, as a token or as a gift for, uh, for supporting the revolution. Does that make sense to everybody? Right, yeah, okay. So. Um, so in my neighborhood, um, there was a there was a guy who had been um, uh, loyal to to Batista, and his home ended up being given to a woman who would become the hairdresser in my neighborhood <laughs> because she was loyal to the revolution. Does that uh, make sense? Okay. So um, anyway, so so uh, this guy's name was Fermin Cowley, and he was uh, a colonel in, in for uh, under the military for Batista. So um, he died, and I wrote him a, a pretend obituary. Kind of looks like this, right? So the fact that he dies sort of enables her to come into the neighborhood. So, so the little obit that I created sort of, uh, sort of sets the precedence for the poem itself. And Peluquera is a hairdresser, right? Okay, obituary. Colonel Fermin Cowley, the architect of Las Pascuas, Las Pascuas Sangrientes, December 24th, 1956, for whom Batista wept, Comandante del Ejército, hunted revolutionaries in La Costa Norte de Oriente, left their bodies in repartos named Las Delicias on Nochebuena, was gunned down, bullet to the chest, outside a hardware shop in Oguin. All that is true. Peluquera. Mumuta moved from Oriente into Fermin Cowley's house at the end of Calle 158 in La Habana after the triumph of the Cuban Revolution and became peluquera de barrio in La Lisa, where news spread que Mumuta Peina, and she was creative too. In a time of escaseces, she knew how to use beer to stiffen hair, how to brush it around the large pink curlers, how heat made it stick together, enabling her to create volume, how when there was no beer, she could use sugar and water, applying the sticky substance that ran down her black fingers to tease and shape the lives of her vecinas, her neighbors, into bucles or moños, and how if she ground peruvia into a powder mixed in alcohol, poured her invento into the government-issued mosquito sprayer, pumped it into a thin mist, como bendición, over the heads of the women who came to her, she could hold their lives in place. She really was my mother's hairdresser. I have no idea what she was really spraying over my mama's hair. I can only guess. So, um, so as I already mentioned, so my mother and I started going to Cuba um, every summer in 1994. And um, for people like me, um, the visit um, is not so much political as it's personal, although I understand that in, th in this community that we live in, everything's political, especially if you're Cuban. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a touchy thing. But, um, but it was a way of reclaiming our history for me, it was a pilgrimage. It was a way to claim the past that had been essentially severed from us uh, by history and circumstances. And so it became important to me to go with my mother every summer to visit Cuba. Um, and the last time I was able to go was in 2006 when the George Bush administration redefined what, meant, what family meant, uh, who you could actually visit on the island. And maybe some of you don't know, but if you're Hispanic, of any kind, right? Cuban, not necessarily even Cuban. You know that family is, you know, your third cousin once removed, right? I mean, that's immediate family, right? Um, so the Bush administration basically said that uh, close family was your mother, your father, your son, or your daughter, um, your husband, or your wife. And outside of that, you couldn't legally travel to Cuba to visit anyone because they were not close family. Does that make sense? And so it became difficult for me to legally travel to the island, so my mother stopped going. So uh, 
the last time I was able to go was in 2006. So I wrote this um, after that last visit. And um, my parents got married in the midst of the, the Cuban Revolution. <laughs> and so I was trying to tell that story. I figured um, I didn't know how much longer it was going to be before I got to go again. And I was trying to tell the stories of my family. So this one, my mother kind of thought I shouldn't write, but I did it anyway. And it's her story, right? This is no love story. My mother stands between the edge of El Barrio Chino, that's uh, Chinatown in Cuba, La Habana Vieja, Entre Rayo, Cuchillo, y Dragones. Those are the names of streets, believe it or not. Between the four-story friendship arch donated by Beijing y Los Escombros, the unpainted colonial squalor where the descendants of Cantonese contract workers who came to the island to work in cane fields collect, the old woman who asked to be photographed with her hairless Asian dog amidst red lanterns, herbal medicine shops, Chinese dragons, a comparsa of oriental chefs in starch white uniforms and six foot tall hats, the smell of boiled pork and sewage wafting over generations of sweaty men, chain smoking on the edge, dangling off the past in front of the Hotel New York, its windows boarded up, its sign hanging precariously above the remains like an oracle. Here, under a portentous sky, the year of the rat, my mother, purple rosary in hand, spent her wedding night, crying into the future, un monte de sombras, as if she could look into the distance, the days of head splashing against the seawall, in malecon, beyond el prado, and with a kind of terror, watch herself step onto a Guantanamo bound bus, arrive, voiceless, to a life as a revolution. A rented room between the GE electric plant my father guards and El Rio Huaso, the Matorrales beyond the night, where the rebeldes hide, waiting for nightfall. Kitchen trenches in which she crawls alone when a tiroteo begins. While across the street, my father makes his pólvora with vodka, liquid courage in shot glasses. As Fidel's column moves from Santiago, Raúl's into Orientes, Camilo's into Pinar de Rio, and Che into Las Villas. But in the bare light of todo aquello, my rum-soaked father, dressed in his Guerrera, bravado, drinking bar to bar in rebel-held Guantanamo, losing his gun, dragging my mother across Oriente, the landscape like a shadow, bragging like some gamecock. Esto no va a durar. Vamos a acabar con ello as if Batista's forces had not begun to surrender, as if Batista had not already orchestrated a New Year's departure complete with 18-piece kangaroo leather luggage set lined with $12 million and an island off the coast of Madeira. Dressed in the black and red colors of La Revolución, the July 26th movement, Dio Casimiro hung over the balcony of his Havana life, though few will admit it now. My mother, La Turista en la Arquitectura del Pasado, centers herself in the shade of the old hotel, diffusing the shadows. Aim here, she says, then waits for the click that will hold her amidst open doors, open lives, Chinese markets, street vendors selling goose eggs and lychees, walking down the street from Calle Salud, where mangoes first grew, from where Fidel's photograph still hangs. Calle Dragones, numero 311, entre Rayo y San Nicolás, 47 years later, inverse square law, caught by the flash, a close-up, the black and white of permanence, he fills the frame, the light falling on the left side of his face, eats arroz frito, drinks Coca-Cola, chopsticks in hand, he is talking and laughing, como si la vida no estuviera marcada de contradicciones, laughing as if life was not marked by contradictions. So I actually, you know, convinced my mother to go stand in front of the dilapidated hotel where she w took, you know, her first night of her honeymoon before heading off to Guantanamo, you know, like it was some sick, perverse metaphor of my parents' marriage. That's why she didn't want me to write the poem. Did everybody get that? I was like, go over there, go over there and stand in, you know, in the, in front of the dilapidated hotel. I'm going to take your picture. I actually really did. I mean, that's a true story. I, I really took the photo. Later, she thought it was funny, but at the time, she thought I was being perverse. So, anyway, um, okay. So, um, ha has anybody ever read any um, Ernest Hemingway? Ernest Hemingway? 
Yeah? Okay. So, you know, Cubans, we, we tend to claim him because he spent so much time on the island, right? And so, um, so the story in Cuba is that he actually spent a lot of time at the Hotel Ambos Mundos, which ironically is called Hotel Two Worlds, which I thought was really kind of interesting. And so, um, so he, he worked on For Whom the Bell Told while he was actually living in that one room uh, in, in this hotel. And so, of course, you know, being the, the history person that I am, I was like, I want to go there. I want to see the room, right? And so, um, okay, so of course I did. So this is, this is the poem to my, my sort of Cuban pilgrimage to um, where Hemingway lived. And I tend to give addresses, you know? It's kind of like, um, it's really hard for me not to like, I don't, I don't want to make things up. I think life is interesting enough. So, so I figured if somebody wants to check me, you know, yeah, the picture's hanging on such and such a place and this is the real physical address. So um, the poem is called Hotel Ambos Mundos. Calle Obispo, número 57, esquina Mercadede, Ciudad Habana. That's the physical address of the hotel. All right, Ambos Mundos. It stands at the end of the street, jotting out of history, like a sad monument to the expatriate who left home to escape himself. Its marble floor is so polished, it bounces afternoon glare onto my face, though I am indoors, drinking foreign beer in a lobby full of German tourists. I ride the steel cage with the elevator man, the system of pulleys and levers, to the fifth floor, room 511, where Ernest Hemingway began, for whom the bell tolls. There are ghosts here. A sparse room, empty corners, wordless spaces where doubts collect like stubborn opticals, obstacles. A typewriter encased in glass, a twin-sized bed facing Havana Bay. What matters is this. The ocean is green, the past is buoyant, and I know he would have preferred to drown. I push open the Caribbean windows to this landscape of sorrows and shadows, empty uh, storefronts, mildewed tenements, where elderly men bathe on balconies, gongools of rainwater to the smell of the sea and fold his secret into my hand. Standing here, a shout away from La Bodeguita de Medio, un conjunto playing downstairs, singing about palmas and boillos, mi tierra. Familiar things. I know he is here, straddling La Pepa y el Mar. Okay, so La Pepa is apparently like really vulgar in Spain, but that's what <laughs> Ernest Hemingway called death. La Beba. So, does anybody have any questions? Surely, you guys have a question. Does anybody have any questions? I, I, I've never asked that. Yeah, there is. Oh shoot, go, talk to me. Um, you mean like when I first came, or like traveling back after I went for the first time? Um. I think when you're a kid, while I understood that we were leaving and, you know, my parents said, you know, we were probably never going to come back here. I think the concept of that doesn't quite set in as reality, right? And then it doesn't help that every year from the time that we arrived, you know, everybody tells this story. I've heard so many writers tell this story that, that Cubans in Miami would say, next year in Havana, next year in Havana. And that's not a myth. People really did believe that, you know, whatever that was will soon be over because historically, um, Cubans were always waited out in Miami and then would just go back, except, you know, we're still here. Right. So um, and so so I think that part of, of the difficulty was um, feeling like, um, you know, you you were in a kind of weird limbo. You know, you're not really from here. Your parents think you're going to go back. So it's a really strange holding pattern. And I don't know at what juncture it finally dawned on them that we're not leaving. This is it. Right. And so so I think that. It was sort of dealing with how my parents deal with exile that was the hardest part. Because as a kid, since everything was new and cool and you had pizza and Coca-Cola and all these people you hadn't seen in a long time, it wasn't the same kind of difficulty as I think they experienced. You know, my parents were in their early 40s. So, you know, dragging, you know, a bunch of kids to a new country where they didn't speak the language could not have been easy, you know. and, and all immigrants know that, you know, starting over is hard. But if you're a kid, you're like, this is so cool. Yeah. 
Um, when did it set in? Um, that's actually like a really, really good question. Um, I think that by the time that I was a teenager, do you know? I mean, I think it took me, you know, I, I think by the time that I was like 15, 16, you know, it was like, oh, this is real life, right? This is not a holding pattern. This is it, right? Um, so it, I think it took a while, you know, and, and um, uh, growing up, because, you know, I went to middle school here, you know, and everything, right? And so I remember wearing, uh, and I don't know, it's like, did my parents get that tacky t-shirt for me? It said, proud to be Cuban, you know? And you're like, oh my God, right? And so um, so it was kind of weird, you know, kind of in a way sort of claiming um, ethnicity to a place that you knew you just didn't belong anymore, right? Um, so so I think the sort of middle school was kind of the, the transition into acceptance, if that answers the question. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, back to live. To visit. I have. I I I went every. I went repeatedly, uh, starting in 1994, um, which was really the weirdest part because uh, apparently, and I didn't know this at the time, you know, my mother and I started going during the special period, which really meant like rolling blackouts and you know. Um, there was no gasoline, so it was really hard to transport yourself from place to place to go anywhere. Um, let me give you a for instance. Apparently, 12 was the magic number for everything you could buy. So Parmesan cheese, you know, that you put on your spaghetti and we take for granted, right, cost $12. So American products were available in the market. They just happened to cost $12. So were four rolls of toilet paper. Twelve dollars, you know, things like that, and so, so it was weird, you know, going back there was weird, but it was hard, especially that first year. Um, I lost about ten pounds in a week. Um, I cried the whole time. Uh, everything was utterly and completely depressing. Um, the place that I remember from was a kid, you know, is really big in your mind. Okay, so I was seven, right? But, you know, it's big, like the streets are big, the house is big, life is large, except it isn't, you know? And so you go there and you're like, oh my God, right? So it's, it was rough, it was really, really terrible. And it made me physically ill, it really did. And it wasn't that I ate anything or drank the water, I just, it was emotionally difficult that first year. And then each subsequent year, because I kept thinking, well, I'm gonna come back next year, I'll see you next year, I'll see you next year. It, that made it easier to deal with all the grief, you know? Does that answer the question? So, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yes, because we were so used to going, and so so what has happened is like um, I, I don't if you're if you're not Cuban you you don't know but like um, Cubans were not able to start visiting the island until after 1980, right? And my mother and I started talking about visiting Cuba, right, in 1983. So it took us about 10 years to be brave enough to go. We're going, right? About 10 years, right? And so, um, so we get there in 1994. We, we go through this sort of how difficultly, difficult emotionally this was. Um, and then we got used to going. Oh, yeah, yeah, we know. Okay, yeah, we need to take this because we ain't going to find no toilet paper over there. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and, then, and then we just couldn't go anymore. And so that idea of I'll see you next year, I'll see you next year, um, was no longer an option. And in the subsequent years, um, my mother's last remaining brother on the island passed away, um, which was really difficult for my mother because that's where we were staying. We never stayed in a hotel. We stayed at the house that my grand... Okay, so when we left the island, um, the government came and sealed the house and said, you can't take anything, right? You're leaving. The house is sealed. That's it. And so, so if, if your house was sealed like that, that meant that the government would get to give that house away to whoever the government wanted. But my mother had my uncle move into our house before we left. So when we left, that house became my uncle's, right? So we were going and staying with my uncle, but literally in the house where I used to live when I was a kid, right? A house my grandmother had bought in the 1950s. So it was kind of like traveling back in time. So after my uncle died, 
We haven't gone back. No, my uncle died. That was it. We haven't gone back in 2006. Uh, my cousin still has the house because his son lived in the house. So, so technically, you know, the family still owns that house, but my uncle's no longer there. So in, in, in that interim, it is exactly like that because now my mother doesn't think she's brave enough to go back there after he has passed away. If that makes sense. Emotionally, it's going to be as difficult going back now as it was the first time. So I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Over there. Um, about, about which part? I mean, how difficult? I, I don't think you... About leaving home. Um, wow, that's, that's kind of... That's intense. Um, I, I think that no amount of advice of any kind, to be honest with you, will prepare you for the difficulty, right, of having to find yourself in another place, in another language, in another culture, and then to become somebody else other than who you were meant to be or who you might have been is kind of like sort of kind of heavy, you know, completely difficult to, to even, you know, sort of get your head around, right? So, wow, you know, I. I I don't know. I don't know if any words of advice will suffice, to be honest. You know, it, it really is that rough, I think. You just have to come to a place of acceptance. And I think for some people, it, it'll take a really long time. And I think some people never get there. Yeah. Did I what? I don't know what that is. He's a Cuban. See, I'm not that Cuban, apparently. I feel like that when I dream, you know, I, I, when I dream, I remember stuff that I forgot or um, I, I think um, I, I have spent my life saying, you know, one day, you know, I will be able to travel back to my home country, um, you know, and, and I, I won't, it won't become, you know, a, a freaking odyssey, you know, I'll just be able to go and travel and stuff um, and it won't be like that kind of a big deal. Um, so I've always hoped that that would be the case. I'm still waiting, you know? So, yeah. Um, I, I think um, no matter when you go, it will always be difficult. It really, really is. And um, as many times as I've gone, I can honestly say that each time I go, even though I haven't gone and I'm trying to convince my mother that we want to go this summer, Ma, we really do. Um, I, I haven't been successful yet. Um, but um, no matter when you go, it'll always feel like that because regardless of what you encounter, the difficulty is emotional. And you could never really prepare for that. You know, because I always think, oh, it's fine, it's fine, I've been there before, no big deal. You know, I set foot on the plane and I'm weeping like an idiot. You know, and it's like, what, what is that? Do you know, I mean, and, and, and I think it has to do with, uh, with loss, right? You know, y y you can never make up for that loss, whatever it is, you know, and, and it's sort of the untangible kind of thing. My favorite writer is uh, Jack Kerouac. Uh, you know, he was the descendant of French Canadians, right? Um, and he, does anybody ever know who he is, Jack Kerouac? Oh, cool. So On the Road, greatest novel, a awesome, right? So um, he said, um, two things that have profoundly spoken to me um, from the time that I first started reading his work. He said, um, I am made of loss. And I thought, we all are. I totally get that. And he said, I accept lostness forever. Jack Kerouac. And I think that's really true, you know? And I think part of being able to deal with things like that, the question you posed, but also yours, is in accepting that we are made of loss and you have to accept it. And part of the difficulty I think for Cubans in exile is um, that's the hardest thing to do. And I think for a lot of Cubans who don't want to go back, it's, that is the problem, right? I, they don't accept loss, they don't accept the consequences of it, you know, but Fidel Castro did not materialize from the ether. You know, there were historical precedents, right? He came from this long historical trajectory. We're gonna have to deal with that. <laughs> and part of that 
has to do with accepting. It's like, let's just accept the 600 pound gorilla in the room and move on. And, and I think that that's part of the difficulty, you know, moving on. And in order to do that, you gotta accept. And I think that's the hardest part. Does that make sense? Yeah, so anybody else? Going once, going twice? No? I don't know, Miss Rita, how are we doing on time? Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. 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 Well, I'm gonna. Re how about I'm gonna read something else that has nothing to do with Cuba, right? Okay. All right. So, um, each uh, little short poems. No Cuba, right? Okay. So, um, uh, a couple of summers ago, actually, th um, the college does this thing where um, the Writers Institute through the Center for Literary Arts and Miami Book Fair International, and they bring writers to teach um, writers uh, workshops, right? Uh, poetry workshops, novel workshops, whatever. Um, and when they bring somebody whose work I respect, whose work I have read, people who have impacted me as a writer, I sign up. And um, about two years ago, um, the college brought Carolyn Forche. Carolyn Forche is a poet, and um, when I went, I went to Florida State, and um, I met her at Florida State when I was in my 20s. And at the time, she had written a book called The Country Between Us. And I thought, oh my God, I wish I thought of that title. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> it's like, that's so great, right? It's a perfect title. Um, anyway, so I got to meet her when I was a, uh, in my 20s, and, um, and she was coming to the college to teach a workshop, and I thought, Sign me up. So I took it. I took the workshop a couple years ago here at the college. And um, after she kind of talked a little bit, she gave us an assignment. And she said, um, she passed books around. And she said that she wanted us to randomly select words. And she gave us, you know, I think it was like five words. Randomly select five words. And she's like, go. And then once everybody had done that, she said, now write something with those words over and over. And I thought, oh my God, that sounds really rough. And then I started rearranging them, and this came out. So I'm gonna read it to you. I told you that everything I write has a, a, a center of truth. So um, when I was in high school, um, this really shy, quiet boy um, passed away. His name was Philip Qualls. And although I hadn't thought about him in years, those words that she gave us brought him back to me. And this is, this is that, the drowned boy for Philip Qualls. I pretend to know, try to figure out the words that, she, that I randomly selected from her assignment. Right, yeah, okay. The drowned boy for Philip Qualls. I pretend to know the way to the spot, the street, the canal, the night that carried you away into silence. I pretend I can save you, steer you away from the spot, the street, the canal, the darkness that swallowed you whole, the sentiment, the stillness, the unknown. I pretend I can rearrange the day, the evening that drove you to the spot, the street, the canal, the darkness down which you floated towards absence. I pretend you survived the past, the evening, the current, the weight of nothing. So, all right, you figured out what the words, all right? Okay, and so, okay. All right, and so, so it was kind of an interesting thing because sometimes you have stories that you wanna write about, you have stories that you wanna tell, even though you're like not even aware of it because I hadn't thought about that for a really long time. Here's somebody that I knew that I went to high school with that just drowned. He literally, like he was driving down the street and he hit a guardrail, he fell into the canal and they never found the body. So he just died, that, just like that, 18 years old, terrible. Anyway, so, um, so that's that. Um, the other place, um, is anybody like interested in writing? I know Carolina uh, Hospital often has uh, students who are like aspiring writers, right? Yeah, where, where are they? Okay, yeah, nobody wants to confess? Oh, you, okay, cool. Um, so, um, so sometimes like words, you know, just words like that will give you an idea even though you weren't expecting it. So that's like one example. And the other thing for me that has always been the case, and maybe this is true for you as well, um, uh, stuff you dream about, right? I, I often write stuff that I dream about because I think that that's my brain trying to tell me to tell a story, 
right? Even though I, I'm not fully aware of that story. So, um, so I'm not trying to be morose, but uh, this, is, this is a dream. Um, and it's, um, I wrote it for somebody I went to high school with who um, passed away. And uh, I, I dream about him often, actually. Um, like he's still alive, and it's the weirdest thing. And this poem is exactly as the dream was, right? And, and I'll tell you what the end means in a second. So it's called Denial for Frank Rudd. You show up to the most unlikely place, Westland Mall, years after you crash your car into a concrete barrier on I-95, fly across the night, becoming an abstraction I keep coming back to. You hand me a piece of paper, ask that I call you, though I know you have a permanent resting place where your broken bones lay. But in dreams, I forget it all. Death and gravity, distance and regret, the particulars out of your out-of-body experience. And imagine that you're alive, that the number you slip into my hand is the link to another you. A cocktail bar in Viejo, California, a fairing plant, a parts hanger in Port Ritchie, Florida, a history museum in New Orleans, Louisiana, a hobby shop in Redmond, Washington, or an antique furniture store in Linwood, where you might be found. So I wrote down the number when I woke up, and I Googled it. And that number is the phone number for all those places. And I just thought that was really kind of interesting. It's like, well, oh, you know, in some surreal plane, you know, Frank Rudd is, you know, working at a fairing plant in, you know, Port Ritchie, Florida. How cool would that be? Anyway, so, um, all right, so, so sometimes um, writing is also about, um, and I think I said this before, and uh, I'm looking at Dr. Kaufman, and she knows I've said this before. So, um, writing has also always been, for me, a way to deal with um, the unresolved. And, um, and some of you writers will know that to be true. Um, I think it was uh, Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath. Um, okay, so you very dark writers, but, um, but, but um, it, words and language matter. And it really becomes a way to tell our stories, um, but also a way to deal with things we don't talk about, uh, things we don't say, or things we need to say and have no other outlet for. Um, and so, so for those of you who write, those are you know sort of food for thought on that. Anybody else? No, going once, going twice. All right. So apparently there are pastries which go with you know Cuban stories. So I definitely think Miss Rita's right, and we should have some. Thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it, and I hope okay, you all have okay, a great okay. day. Okay, Before you jump up, can everybody hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Go. Everything working? Yeah. Okay. First of all, let's give Professor Sandra Castillo another round of applause. Thank you. One, for taking some of us back to Cuba, and two, for giving some of you a glimpse of Cuba. So I think she deserves a big hand.